been taking a little bit of a chance the last couple of weeks in our Sunday morning discussions. It's been less like maybe a traditional sermon and more like an interactive discussion, even though we've got, you know, a pretty decent group of people here in the room. So this morning is also going to take that shape because um, part of why I'm here is not just to give you information. It's actually for us to work through this process together of not only learning about God, but of trying to figure out how to interact with his teachings with what we call the Bible. Um, so that when you leave here, there's six more days in a week, right? And we want you to be equipped to be able to take scripture and uh, understand it, to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit and have this really vibrant relationship with God that kind of follows you everywhere you go throughout the week, not just something where you feel like you come here and, and I give you ways to think because honestly, I mean, I might be off some weeks and my perspectives might be very limited. Certainly they are. Um, so we're going to work through this together and probably be better as a result of it. Um, I don't know about you, and again, just to give you a little bit of context, we've been working through Matthew's gospel, and throughout Matthew, toward the end especially, Jesus teaches in these story forms called parables. And so uh, we come across another one this morning, and we're looking at how to interact with that. But uh, my kids, probably a year and a half ago or so, they were browsing through Netflix, and they came, they like cooking shows for some reason. I don't know why my six, eight, ten-year-old kids like cooking shows, but they do. And they came across this one that's called, Is It Cake? And maybe you've seen that one as well, maybe not. If not, maybe it'll be your ne new Netflix binge show, I don't know. But Is It Cake, the whole premise of it is they have these chefs, these bakers that come onto the show, and they try to create cakes that replicate common everyday objects, and they'll have themes for the week. For example, uh, fast food items, and so they'll have a selection of fast food items, and then you'll have to pick out the one that's cake. And they bring on celebrity judges and others to interact with this, and you as the viewers at home have to try to look at the cake and the real objects and figure out which one's which, and they'll have different things, cakes imitating fashions or tools or things in your garage or kids' toys. And so it's all these different imitations. And sometimes it's really, really hard, but it's a side-by-side -side comparison. And you've got to think deeply and you look at things like, how glossy is that toy? Is it really a cake? Is it icing? Could they replicate that? What's the coloring like? What's the arrangement, the presentation? What's the texture? Does it look like the size, you know, is within ratio? Or is one part of this object a little bit, you know, out of size or out of shape? So you're using all these things and you come to this crisis of decision at the end. What is it? Is it cake? And parables are kind of the same way. The, the word parable itself, it just means a side-by-side -side comparison. So Jesus is giving you a story, and you're supposed to set that story alongside some real-life present circumstance that Jesus is talking about in the moment in his Gospels and say, how do these two situations compare? What are the hearers of this story in real time in the first century? What are they supposed to take away from that? And then perhaps even the bigger challenge is for us reading these stories 2,000 years in the future, what are we supposed to take away from those stories? So this morning we're going to take one of the parables, the next one that we're coming to here in Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 14, and we're going to make a little journey of it together and look at how to approach parables, how to make sense of the parables, and then how to try to find significance in the parables in ways that are like in line with the way that Jesus maybe intended them to be um, processed originally. And so we're going to do that, but as we do that and talk about the steps, we're going to go through and dissect this parable together and learn from each other through more discussion and more conversation today. So first, let me introduce you to today's parable. Um, it's up on the screen, but the print's really small, so you might want to look on your phones or in your own Bibles. If you want to follow us along, again, it's Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14, because we're going to be talking about different aspects of this, and it helps to have visual sometimes in front of you, um, if that's your learning style. So here's this parable that Jesus speaks. He says, once again, here's another one he's giving us. He says, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, and that's been a theme throughout Matthew, this community of people who are following God, um, who are on the world in Jesus' time, who are his disciples, his believers, people who have already gone to be with the Lord, who are in his presence in heaven, us today, people who are part of his kingdom, his community, his followers. That kingdom, that group, he says, it's like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to summon those invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. So again, he sent out other slaves, and he said, 
tell those who are invited. See, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted cattle have been slaughtered and everything's ready, so come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and they went away. One went to his own farm and another went to his business. And the rest of them, they seized his, ser his servants, his slaves. They mistreated them and they killed him. So the king was enraged and he sent out his troops and he killed those murderers and he burned down their city. Then he told his slaves, the banquet's ready, but those who were invited, they weren't deserving. So go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you can find to the banquet. So the slaves went out on the roads outside the city and they gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. Then the wedding banquet was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, though, he saw a man, one, who was there who wasn't dressed for a wedding. And there's a little bit left in the parable, but I'm going to just stop here for now. That gives us enough to talk about. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Why is he telling this story? How does it relate to his audience then, and how does it relate to us? We're going to jump in because you encounter these parables all throughout the Gospels. So here's a few reminders, and as we work through, we'll talk about some of the details. So parables, as I mentioned, they're side-by-side -side comparisons. Is it cake? Right? And they're intended to reveal something to the audience, something either about values in God's kingdom versus just human nature and what human nature values and prizes in the world, so set those things apart. Or it's going to show us something about Jesus' nature, God's nature, um, or Jesus' mission on earth, what he's about. Or it's going to show people, the immediate audience, something about the condition of their hearts. Where are their hearts at here in the moment? So we're going to be looking for those elements as we kind of uh, pull apart this parable and we examine it more. Values in God's kingdom, something about Jesus' nature and mission, or something about people's hearts who were in the audience listening to Jesus tell this in person. Okay. Second thing, parables are forms of indirect communication. Okay. You could come and just throw something at somebody, right? Some of you are very direct people and you just tell like it is. But others of us don't receive direct communication real well because in our hearts we're kind of rebellious, right? We don't like people telling us what to do, right? And if you happen to be one of those people who doesn't want somebody to say, this is how it is, this is what you should do, if somebody does it, what are you going to do? Just resist more, right? Put up a wall and say, well, I'm not doing things the way you want me to do it. I'll do things the way I please. And there are people in Jesus' audience like this. And the great thing about parables are they kind of come in through the back door, they're indirect. They don't make direct accusations. They just throw these stories out there for consideration. And when you think about them, you realize, oh, there's something in this. There's a meaning behind this. Jesus is trying to talk to me if you're listening to him in person. And so it's indirect. Another thing that's beautiful about that is for some people, these parables, they reveal something. These people are open-minded and they're listening and they're discovering and they realize something new about God's kingdom or something about Jesus that they've never seen before or something about their own hearts and they're really humble and moldable. Um, then other people, these don't make sense at all. So it conceals. They hear this and they think that's, just, that's such a stupid, nonsensical story. Why would Jesus talk about that? What does that have to do with God? And then there are other people who feel like Jesus is talking to me, and it's not in a good way. Jesus is pointing out a flaw that's deep within me, and I don't like it. But he didn't say anything directly. He just told the story. So it's a really uh, unique way of communicating, especially with people who may not be open to listening. And maybe we can learn something from that. Another thing, and we're going to start to dissect this parable together, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'd like some feedback this morning, if you'd help me out. Thirdly, parables, they're this response that Jesus gives within a certain context, and a lot of times within a conversation. 
So when you read a parable, you really have to pay attention to what's happening right before the parable, either the conversation or the context or where things are flowing or what the themes are. And then you've got to look kind of right after the parable as well because sometimes Jesus summarizes a point at the end of it, but then there's a conversation that continues or something in this case in Matthew's gospel that Matthew's leading the reader of the gospel of Matthew toward. And so what's happening around it? And if you were here, especially the last couple of weeks, what can you tell me about the context of where this parable that we read today is set? What's happening? We know it's in the last week before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. He is coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowds were shouting, Hosanna, which means save us now. But what beyond that's happening? What have we talked about the last two or three weeks here? What else is going on in the story that gives us a context for the meaning of this? What do you remember? I'll prod you if you don't. I'll remind you. But think about this. After Jesus, uh, he kind of pushed some people who were using unfair exchange rates to steal from people and people who were selling animals for ridiculous prices out of the temple. And then there were these kids that were praising him by, by imitating the adults. And he was healing some lame people and some blind people in the temple courts. How, is, how are different groups of people reacting to that? Yes? So there was the response by the religious leaders, right? Yeah. So the kids were making the response, and then the religious leaders commented on that. And the rest of the underlying political sort of effort to try to address the Jesus problem by the political and religious leaders. All right. So John said there's this thing brewing with some of the religious leaders where they have some political ambitions and they're not real happy with what Jesus is doing. They're kind of frustrated and, and off-put by the fact that Jesus would allow these children to, to be praising him in the temple, the religious place, and would allow these people who are uh, dealing with disabilities um, to exist in the temple space, this pure, holy place. And, and what they want and even maybe their political ambitions are kind of starting to butt heads with the way Jesus is approaching things. So there's trouble brewing, right? What else? Do you remember anything else about the context? Tell me about the fig tree. You remember about the fig tree a couple weeks ago? What did we learn from the fig tree or what are some possible takeaways from that? Okay, it didn't produce fruit because, well, Jesus, he walked up to the fig tree. It didn't have any fruit on it because it wasn't time for fruit to be ripe on a fig tree yet. And he said, may you never produce fruit again. And it just withered like on the spot. It started dying. But why? Was that some... Okay, so Deborah reminded us that this fig tree was kind of symbolic of where these religious leaders were at in their hearts. They weren't bearing fruit, especially not in the heart, for God. And so it was kind of symbolic of that. And even some scriptures in the Old Testament uh, talk about withering fig trees and trees that don't have any early figs on them in comparison with the hearts of the people in Jerusalem and oftentimes the leaders of the people. And so between what John said and what Deborah shared, we kind of have a context of religious leaders who are not bearing fruit, political leaders who are in opposition to Jesus, and that's kind of the prevailing theme. Then if we look right after this parable, Jesus tells more stories, and there's also an attempt by the religious leaders, uh, different groups, different political groups in the city. They, it's like one by one, they step up to the plate, and they take a crack at Jesus to try to do something that will humiliate him publicly or test him. And group after group comes up right after this. And so it's all set in the context of this opposition, especially by the political and the religious leadership in Jerusalem against Jesus. And so that's where this parable is set. And so whatever this parable means, it has to relate to that context. And it has to involve these religious and political leaders in some way. Because it's set in that context in the conversation. And Matthew wrote that in the gospel at this point for a reason. Here's another thing about parables. Parables often include unfamiliar cultural or historical references or both. Can I have you go back to that, uh, the verses on the screen? It's just the next slide. 
So in what we've read so far, especially if you happen to have a Bible open or something up on your phone right now, is there anything unfamiliar, or just if you have a good memory, anything unfamiliar in this story culturally, something that you don't deal with or experience in everyday life? Do you need me to read it to you one more time? Listen for this, okay? The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to summon those who were invited to the banquet, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, look, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted cattle, fattened cattle had been slaughtered, and everything is ready, so come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, and one went away to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent out his troops, killed those murderers, and burned down their city. And he told his slaves, the banquet's ready, but those who were invited, they weren't deserving. So go to where the roads exit the city and invite everyone you can find to fill the banquet. So they went out on the roads and they gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. And the wedding banquet was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Anything seem different than what you experience in everyday life here. Yeah, right. I mean, there's one thing, right? How many of you have the fatted calf tied up out back somewhere and you're going to slaughter that for the, the wedding celebration or the celebration in general? And so that's one thing. And this is something that you read in the Bible, different places, how they, they killed the fatted calf. It's like you almost had to have something, you know, in reserve, ready for a celebration almost. And so culturally, that was an element. Um, anything else that you don't experience in your day-to-day life from this parable? You invited all those people with all that good food, they come. Okay, maybe. Yeah, in this case, it's interesting that they didn't. Well, let's talk about a wedding banquet. Is that a familiar thing in our culture? Can we relate to that? We kind of have receptions, right? And some people throw a feast and a party. So maybe that's something that is familiar. That was a cultural element then and today, even though we don't have the calf tied up out back, you know, for the celebration. But we can kind of relate with that. Um, sure. What about, uh, what about clothes? Um, how many of you have put on weddings for one of your kids? Like you've been the one footing the bill for that. A few of you in here? Okay. My oldest two kids are girls, and so if we follow the tradition of things, we'll see. Um, That means I've got some weddings to pay for in a few years, right? How many of you bought clothing for everybody that came to your wedding? Right? I mean, if you're being generous, maybe you cover uh, the people in the wedding party. Probably not. Not very many people did that for me when I was in people's weddings, right? But this is a king here, and this king is providing wedding clothes, it seems, so is that, is that a thing? Is that something everyone did at this day and age? That's something to look into. You may not have answers to these different cultural differences that pop up. You may have to dig deeper. So because our time's limited, I've dug a little deeper on a few of these things. So I have some thoughts to throw out at you. Um, wedding clothes for the bride and groom different clothes were not strange in this culture. They had some specific things. A lot of times the bride and groom at this point in time in history would wear a crown. They were almost viewed as royalty on their wedding day. If they were wealthy, it would be made of gold or some type of precious metal. If they were of humble means, it would be woven wool or something like that. But providing clothes for all the guests, as far as I can dig up, wasn't even a cultural thing in Israel. However, Kings provided clothes often for people. And if you look in scripture at situations where kings provided clothes, interesting things start to surface. Um, Pharaoh, when Joseph in the book of Genesis was exalted to second in command of Egypt, one of the first things the Pharaoh did was he brought him in, he cleaned him up, and he provided him with new clothes. It was a way of honoring someone. In the book of Esther, when Naaman thinks that the, the emperor uh, wants, of Persia wants to honor him. The, the king comes up and says, what should I do for the person I want to honor? And Naaman says, well, dress him in your finest clothes and put him in your chariot. Let him parade through the city. And then Naaman realizes it's the guy that he hates who's going to get dressed in uh, great clothing and paraded through the city. But it's this idea of the person the king wants to honor, the king provides clothing to. And that's interesting because it's all of these people that they found outside the city gates, good and bad, all walks of life, and yet the king wants to honor those people with the clothing. Interesting, isn't it? Um, 
What about slaves? Now, there are parts of the world today where people are enslaved, and even here, undoubtedly, people are human trafficked under our noses. We're oblivious to it. But publicly, in everyday culture, you can't go down to the corner market and purchase another human being to have for a slave. So this is something culturally that, right, it's a little bit different for us. We have heard things through history, but we don't experience this in the same way today. Our leaders locally and, and uh, nationally don't have, you know, an armada of slaves that they own. But apparently this king in the story did, and he sent them out. Another thing that's interesting in the Bible, if you trace that theme of slaves, things start to pop up. Um, slaves are referred to in the Old Testament, but a lot of times the people who are called slaves, at least God's slaves, are these figures called the prophets. And these Old Testament prophets are people that are continually ignored, interestingly enough, by the religious and political leaders in Jerusalem and in Israel over and over and over and over again. So maybe there's some significance to these things, again, that are different in our culture, but if we investigate them a little bit more and we figure out some of the whys behind why they might be in the parable, um, it just fills out things and provides us with a few more answers. So after we've considered the context and looked a little bit into the culture, and again, this is a discussion. I think parables are probably best digested in conversation with friends, honestly, because there's no way that you're going to see everything or that I'm going to see everything. And it's going to be something where three or four years from now or 10 years from now or 20, something else will pop into your head and you'll think, oh, I wonder if that's why that was in there. I wonder, oh yeah, that makes sense. So it's a continual process of discovery. But one of the best things that you can do to kind of make sense of the parables is to look at the characters. Because in these parables, the main characters or sometimes main groups of characters, they're going to represent something or someone significant to the people who are listening. Because there is some sort of meaning, some sort of symbolism behind the parables. And you can really get to the heart of it through the main characters. Sometimes these main characters are going to represent something or someone, and sometimes they're going to be contrasting to something or someone. But if you took these main characters out of the parable, the whole meaning would fall apart, and the whole storyline would fall apart. So from what you've seen in the parables so far, who would you choose or who would you select? Who would you think might be the main characters in this parable that Jesus is telling? The king. Okay, the king. Yeah, I would say that's valid, right? The king shows up in like every other line of this. The king seems to be driving the action. He's doing the invitations. Um, it's his son who's getting married at the banquet. Um, he is the owner and the sender of the slaves. He is the one who's responding to uh, the people who reject his invitation, right? So the king is a pretty central character. You take him out and it falls apart. You don't have a story. Who else? Okay, I heard two answers. Um, I heard slaves barely first. Hold on to that thought, Deborah. Okay, someone over here? Slaves. The slaves, okay? You see the slaves, right? The word comes up over and over again. And if it comes up over and over again, a lot of times it'll indicate this is the main character, okay? So we have the, the king, the, the slaves, that's just a group. And then, Deborah, what did you say? Yeah, um, I would say like the, the invited guests who don't come, that seems to be another major theme here, like these invited guests. And at the very end, you get a glimpse of people who do show up, but they're not really the invited guests. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, who do you invite to a wedding? Who do you ask? Who's on the uh, guest list? <coughs> Friends and family. Like 20 of you said that at the same time, right? That's who you invite to a wedding. And I would think with the king, it's probably no different. Friends and family. And people within the city, within the kingdom, right? Those are the invited guests. And ironically, those are the ones that decide not to come. Some just because they've got better things going and other ones who are actually antagonistic, it seems like, because they, they take the slaves and they just kill them when they come to try to get them to come to the wedding banquet. I mean, talk about animosity in the family or friend group. That's a crazy thing to think about, wrap your mind about, around. So we've got three main characters or groups of characters. We've got the king, we've got the slaves, we've got the invited guests who decide for whatever reason I'm not going to come or I'm uh, angry even that I received the invitation. 
in a parable set in context with religious and political leaders who are opposed to Jesus. If you think about who these characters might represent or potentially what, who would you think the king in this story might represent? Okay, Jesus, God. Does Jesus ever tell you who the king represents in the parable? He doesn't. That's the beauty of the parable because it makes us think. You remember what Jesus told? The son would have to be Jesus. Perhaps. Because if it's his way and it's his people, then it's his Perhaps. So maybe the king is God. We'll say maybe the king is Jesus. But there's this king figure who we tend to associate maybe with God in some way in the parable. Let's assume that that's the case. If the king is God, who would the slaves be? Who? The prophets? Maybe the disciples? We'll take a look at that parable in just a minute in light of that and see what we conclude. What do you think about the guests who were invited, the friends and relatives who just for whatever reason didn't want to show up? Who might those be? That's a good question. And see, these parables, they invite more and more and more questions. And you might figure out the main gist and the characters, but then you still have these other nagging questions, which is why you sit down with a group of friends in conversation and say, what's this about? Yeah. You're going to come up with more and more questions, which is, part, again, part of the wonder about teaching in parables versus just telling somebody a piece of information. So... Um, Why would they not be thinking about the bride and groom? Yeah, and the, yeah, sure. Like they seem to be focused on themselves, don't they? Yeah. So we're getting more information about potentially who these, you know, invited guests are, right? Why would they be responding in these ways? And those types of questions give us maybe more clues as to who these people are. Non-believers. Perhaps. Don't forget the context. The leaders of the Perhaps it's the leaders, the political leaders, the religious leaders in Israel who were so opposed, so adamantly opposed to, if you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh on earth, to what God is doing in the moment. And then when you start to insert those characters into things, there's some clarity that all of a sudden starts to show up. One more time, not to be repetitious, but so that we can fill in some of the blanks, I'm going to read the parable. And I want you to think of the parable in light of who these characters are if the symbolism is God, the prophets or the disciples or the servants of Jesus, um, and then these religious political leaders who are opposed. How does the story speak then? The kingdom of heaven is like a king, God, who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves, the prophets, to summon those invited to the banquet the Jews, the relatives, the religious leaders, the political leaders in Jerusalem. But they didn't want to come. Again, he sent out other slaves and said, tell those who are invited, Israel, the religious and political leaders, the people of Jerusalem. Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle. They've been slaughtered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went away, one to his own farm, another to his own business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. His slaves, the prophets, mistreated them and killed them. Is there anything like that that you've seen in Scripture happening, playing out? It's, yeah, the last third of what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. It's an ongoing cycle. The king, God, was enraged and sent out his troops and killed those murderers and burned down their city. Now remember in the parables, it's a story. And so we'll talk about it at the end as we conclude in a few minutes. Be careful about overanalyzing and applying every single trait to every single character and drawing too many analytical conclusions. But in this story, the king was enraged. Then he told his slaves, the banquet's ready, but those who were invited were not deserving. Maybe his slaves, the prophets. Maybe at this point, his slaves, the disciples, as Bob shared. So go to where the roads exit the city and invite everybody you find to the banquet. So the slaves went out onto the roads and they gathered everyone they found. It says both evil and good. 
Now, the word evil is loaded because we think evil and we think evil, right? But evil is a broad word in this culture. It can mean bad, morally compromised. It can mean an outcast of society. It can mean somebody who is uh, diseased, like is dealing with sickness. It could be somebody who is despised or depressed or discouraged. It's a broad word. But when you think about the people who collected around Jesus, do any of those adjectives apply? Like virtually all of them, right? So invite the good and invite the evil, the downcast, the broken, the sick, the hurting, the ones with less than stellar reputations. So they went out and they gathered everybody they found and the wedding banquet was filled with guests. Again, this parable is about the kingdom of God. That's how Jesus said it. So you're learning anything about the values and the makeup of God's kingdom from this. It says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed for a wedding. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why he wasn't dressed for a wedding. What do you think? Maybe. Maybe because he wasn't an Israelite. I don't know. It's a good thought. What else? Why do you think he wasn't dressed for the wedding? What are some options? He didn't have the money for it. That's an option, right? He wasn't invited. Okay, that's possible. Now, there was a big effort, though, to be honest, to invite people to this banquet, right? So perhaps he got overlooked, but the probabilities, maybe, you know, we have to consider that. Maybe he didn't have money, but did you think some of the poor and oppressed people have money for the wedding? Where do you think they got their clothes? Where? From the king. So here's another thought. If the king gave everybody clothes, why doesn't this man have his clothes? Not worthy of there. I mean, maybe not worthy, but think about the crowd here. It seemed like everybody, even the bad people, were worthy. So maybe, but you've got to consider things. He was in opposition. Maybe he was in opposition to the king's authority, Robert suggested. I mean, if the king had all of the resources, and the king provided the clothes for these people that weren't even expecting to come to a banquet who were just coming out of the city in the streets, and that's the assumption, I think, then perhaps the reason why this individual wasn't wearing the wedding clothes is because he was sort of defiant, and he had them, but he just chose to go to a wedding and knowingly, purposefully not wear the clothes. Can you think of anybody in the context who would have that attitude toward God? Perhaps, right, in this immediate context of people who Jesus is talking amongst. Maybe the political and the religious, religious leaders in Israel, the people that had different agendas, the people that saw God's kingdom as being a much more refined group of people, more, you know, perfect on the outside, maybe struggling on the inside, uh, covering all of that up kind of uh, facilitating their own kingdom and their own agenda, the, the people who are definitely um, Israelite by, by ethnicity, those people, you know, they seem to be in opposition to Jesus. And they might have been the type of people who just wouldn't wear the wedding clothes to the banquet. Maybe, perhaps. So that's a question. It's interesting. And it says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw the man there who was not dressed for the wedding. And this is the rest of the story. So he said to him, friend. This is another thing. It gets slightly altered in translation. What Jesus says is not friend. Literally, it would be kinsman, relative. And so this king is talking to one of his relatives who was one of presumably the invited people, the first group of invited people to the wedding. And so this relative, for some reason, shows up. But maybe he's not supportive of the wedding, or maybe he has something against the king, but he decides that instead of killing the king's slaves and just doing his own thing, he's actually going to show up, but he's maybe not going to wear the wedding clothes. So the king says, friend, relative, How'd you get in here without wedding clothes? 
The man was speechless. If I had just been overlooked, I would say, well, nobody gave me wedding clothes, sir. If I couldn't afford them, I would say, well, I have no money. But the fact that this man had nothing to say at least kind of conjures up the idea that possibly it was because the fault was his own. It was his choice, perhaps. Then the king told his attendants, the people who were serving people at the wedding banquet, different from slaves, more like table waiters, tie him up hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus says, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Seems a little interesting. That brings up a lot of interesting thoughts in our minds as well. But before we get into those interesting thoughts, as we try to make sense of parables, they're going to bring us to this crisis of decision. What are we seeing about the values in God's kingdom? What are we seeing about the nature of Jesus and Jesus' mission? What are we seeing about the condition of our own hearts, even if it's not pretty? Even if God is confronting us, the ball is put in our court. But even more so, the ball is put in the court of the immediate audience who's listening to Jesus. And so as a religious leader, as a political leader who is uh, in your heart, you realize that you are opposed to Jesus and what he's doing and you're irritated and you're frustrated and you want him out of the way. How does this parable intercept you? How did, what kind of a response does it create in you? And what kind of a decision does it put before you? That's what it's doing. And then there are other people who are the ones who are the outcasts, the ones who are the sick and the diseased and the ones in despair. And hearing this story, what type of a response does it give to you? How do you see things differently? And you start to notice the brilliance of parables and why Jesus teaches and operates the way that he does. So this is making sense, hopefully a little more. As we close, I'm going to give you five, I guess, pointers for finding significance for yourself. Because you are not sitting in front of Jesus. You are not one of the religious leaders in opposition to Jesus or the political leaders. You are not one of the crowd You are not one of Jesus' followers who don't know what's going to happen in the next week because your leader has said he's going to die, but you think that's impossible given these predictions about this Messiah figure. That's not you. You're removed 2,000 years from this. I think there is still significance, but I think we have to be careful what types of significance we draw from it. So first of all, when Jesus teaches these things, he's not speaking to our present-day situations. For example... He's not providing us with a template for how we should do weddings. He's not saying, if you want to do a proper wedding, buy some fatted calves and oxen and uh, make a guest list and invite all your friends and relatives and buy clothes for everyone who attends a wedding. This is not a direct application to some situation in our life. Secondly, Jesus is not teaching a single moral truth. When we talk about parables or fables today, most of the things that we hear about in our culture over the last 150 to 200 years, especially in like European-based culture and folklore and tales, a lot of those stories teach a single moral truth, like tell the truth or something of that nature, share your toys. This isn't teaching us something like when somebody invites you to something important, you better go. Or when somebody brings you to something, you better follow the rules and wear the clothes. It's not driving at a single moral truth. Also, Jesus is not trying to attach a symbolic meaning to every single detail of the story. He's not teaching us that God is enraged like the king was with people that ignore his invitation and mistreat his servants. And he will always deliver swift punishment and retribution. Because there are moments where you see the God of Israel in the Old Testament respond quickly and decisively. And there are a whole lot of moments where you read Psalms where David and others are saying, why God do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? And they may be writing that story the rest of their lives, feeling like God is just leaving injustice open wide. And so God is patient and you can't necessarily Put him into that slot where you're making theological conclusions about God based on every detail of the story. 
You also can't conclude these types of things. Well, since the fatted calves were killed, God wants everyone to eat meat. Therefore, people who are vegan or vegetarian, they're off the path. You can't say something like, well, the business, that was the distraction in these people's lives. So everybody who's involved in business, they're caught up in money and they're distracted from the more important things in life. You can't attach symbolism to that. It's tempting to say things like, the son has to be Jesus, perhaps. Perhaps you can make an argument to that. But then if the son is Jesus, it's tempting to say, well, the guests who attend the wedding, that must be the church. And the wedding clothes, because the guests of the church, that must symbolize righteousness. Because clothes symbolize righteousness somewhere else in the Bible. And the attendants, they must be the angels. And the outer darkness, that's got to be hell. And the weeping and gnashing of teeth means eternal punishment. Because everything has to be symbolic. Jesus is telling a story, and it's got a meaning to the audience, and there's some main points when we, try to, when we try to attach symbolism to every single thing, it sends us down some roads that might be a little bit presumptuous. Outer darkness just simply refers to the darkness that's outside the banquet hall, right? The binding has to do with the way that prisoners were handled in those days. And so it makes it sound like the king is sort of treating this person like a prisoner and they're just tossed outside. They're not a part of this banquet, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's a phrase that's a Hebrew idiom, and it can have a lot of different meanings. It can be somebody's intensely angry, somebody's emotionally sad, somebody's frustrated, somebody's guilt-ridden, and so to try to say, this has to mean this, because all of these things mean these other things, might be a little presumptuous. It's not necessarily designed to give us theological insights or an allegory. It's addressing a current situation and trying to make a point to people who otherwise wouldn't be receptive to that point in the conversation. But that doesn't mean parables don't still apply, because they were placed in the Gospels for a reason, for future readers. So there's still some significance for us. And maybe what the significance is, and I'll let you kind of continue the conversation, maybe it's just calling us to embrace the same kinds of kingdom values or claims about Jesus and his nature, or maybe the inward changes that the crowd is being called to that's listening to the parables in real time. And maybe the reason that God is calling us to those same sorts of ideas and heart changes and attitudes and practices is because those things, if we adopt them 2,000 years later, people will see Jesus in us. And people will be drawn to Jesus through us and the change that he's working in our hearts. And maybe that's the purpose of these parables. 